All right, guys, welcome to another episode of On the Limb with Nature's Voice Game Calls. Tonight we have Jeff Antis from Michigan, and we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, his co-op that he does there. And uh, we're going to be talking about APR, which when I talked to him earlier today, I thought he was talking about interest rates, but <laughs> I, I don't guess that's what it is. So, Jeff, how you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Good. Nice glad to have you, you could, Jeff. Uh, glad you could be here this evening. I got Dan Hall with me this evening, co-host, and also co-host uh, Dave Young with us today. He hadn't been with us for a while, so welcome back, yeah. Dave. Good yeah, to be he's, back, He's everybody. got too much life going on. <laughs> Oh man, four kids. What do what do you do? I don't know. Yeah. Quit having them. Oh. <laughs> four kids and they're girls too. Yes. Yes. All Keep right, Jeff. Away. So uh tell us a little bit about the co-op that you work with there in Michigan. Well, here about seven years ago, we had a we had some uh monies that got sent around the state a little bit to some of the organizations. Um they had actually had people that was working with the DNR that was heading up that that was um encouraging co-ops and they actually had a person um, employed just to head that up and uh, when we got going there it was it was basically you know you, you basically they just tell you that the first thing you need is you need to get two neighbors together with the same kind of ideas of what you want to do for deer management well i was already lucky enough that there were several of us in the area that were already kind of working together a little bit and and doing some deer management and stuff so we we got together and had a little meeting and then from there we we got a facebook group and we got a name and we called it bacon creek quality deer cooperative which the only the only uh township that the bacon creek runs through there's an actual bacon creek up here that runs right through bushnell township and we started talking to some neighbors and we started getting the word out and we had a couple little meetings and got together and have a burger and a beer and and basically all it is is we kind of set it up for just for the for neighbors and stuff to work together and to communicate and we uh actually got some pretty good lasting friendships out of it so nice it's it's a pretty good deal you know and then and the the thing is is if you put 10 hunters in a room at the same time and nine of them agree you're doing something good so yeah so so you just oh, get absolutely the, you get the neighbors there together and you get the farmers and stuff together and you all kind of just do like a white-tailed deer management right correct we uh we we basically we kind of just kind of encourage some communication um you know obviously we we set some goals and, and encourage people to set goals for what they want to do with with their property and with their hunting um the main thing is to have some fun and build some relationships that's the main thing and in and kind of in the aftermath of all that you, you you start managing the deer herd a little better and you and you just keep educating each other the most that you can how how hard was that i know like it's, back home it it it's a fight you know i we talk to people like hey let's let's work on this let's try to manage some properties here you connect to me i connect to you we can grow some big deer if if we do this and we do this and we do this, but how, how hard was it for you guys? It was kind of hard. I mean, I guess it wasn't as hard as some people would think it would be, especially for us. I guess we got lucky because basically the, the whole thing is to lay it out there and you show your neighbors what you're doing, what you're passing, what kind of habitat improvements are you doing? You know, what are you building for food plots? Yeah. Um, you, you put that out there and, and the less you keep hidden, you know, they kind of feel a little maybe more relaxed to saying, well, maybe this guy's really telling the truth, you know? So we share trail camera pictures. We help each other do food plots. Um, we actually have a, a big meeting once a year that we all get together and we have some food brought in and we have a drink and we even take uh, little rides around and we'll go visit each other's properties and look at what other guys have did for the habitat improvements and stuff. So basically, it's basically if you just get it out there and you put the information out there and, and you keep beating that in, into the guys, you know, and, and some people are very reluctant. I mean, there's guys that still don't share trail camera pictures and they think they're keeping it a big secret of what's going on. But oh, if sure. you get enough people in one area and, and you keep doing that, it just kind of grows from property to property and then more people get involved. And after it's been, we've been going for like seven years now. And so we roughly got, I think we got a Facebook group that's got all oh, like 140 some people in it. We were averaging right around 400 for 4,500 acres. that's in the co-op, you know, that, that actually put the dot on the line and say, Hey, you know, we're part of this. And it, and it's just, I, I, you can't just stress enough that the, it's the communication and, and the thing that got this set and got going is, you know, neighbors need to be neighbors. And right. And yeah, back definitely. in the day when, you know, when I was a young kid, I remember my mom and dad drinking coffee with the neighbors and it, you get to the modern 
modern day, most neighbors don't even know each other's names. So I know, isn't it crazy? Well, that's, I mean, that's like, you're talking, I just bought some property, went up there the past weekend and I actually got the chance to meet one of the, the front neighbor. And then the neighbor that lives all the way at the bottom of the holler from me, I got to meet him. He was coming in, you know, we got to talking like, Hey, if you need anything, I'm here to help you. He's like, Oh yeah, same, you know, and that, and that's how it starts. You, you've got to become friendly with the neighbors. Yeah, that, that's the key, like right there. And the, and the thing is, you know, I, I help several different guys do food plots and stuff, and I don't ask anything in return. I don't I don't expect them to come over and help me. I don't expect them to let me hunt their property or nothing like that. I'm just there because I'm passionate about white-tailed deer, and I'm passionate about keeping things real around here. So Yeah, that's awesome. Um, no, another another thing is is you just, like I said, with sharing with the trail cameras and stuff like that, it's giving a hand, you know, and, and one thing about that is to enjoy it. I mean, I, I had a neighbor last night. I was sitting in a tree stand myself. I was hunting. He messaged me and said, hey, man, my, my daughter just shot a real nice buck. And I said, I'll be there in five minutes, you know, and, and that's what we do. We get together and, and even that we celebrate each other's harvest. And we don't really necessarily push, you know, you got to shoot these giant monster bucks. I mean, I'm a big supporter of APRs or antler point restrictions. We'll get into that a little bit. And, but, um, you know, I, I'm in support of letting some of the smaller bucks go, but there's no one here that needs to judge each other, you know, and, and that's the thing. And, and just because I support that doesn't mean I'm just trying to make giant bucks. I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just doing that for myself. So everybody has to set their own goals. And that's, that's one thing that we, that I strive for is I, is I want to see people succeed as a hunter. I don't want them to, I don't want them to just sit there and watch every deer walk by. I want them to be happy and enjoy it. So that's like the biggest thing. You just got to have fun and you build those relationships and high fives and smiles and maybe a cold drink at the end and everybody's happy. Yeah, that's awesome. That's one thing I was going to ask about was uh, you all help people track and stuff like that. Y'all got like a, a group thing that when somebody harvests a buck or doe or something, you all help them track it if they can't find it. Well, they We sure do. I mean, it's like tonight, actually, there was a gentleman that just texted me just before we tried to get this podcast going thing here and he'd shot a nice buck. So I'm missing out tonight. So the guys are all together. They're probably celebrating right now and I haven't got a picture of him yet. Oh, man. <laughs> well, that just that just gives you a chance to tell them about the podcast. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we can celebrate with you. We'll drink one yep. with you. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's how it goes. I mean, usually there's a, you know, there's even with a, with a group that's, you know, our group, I mean, there's smaller subgroups. So, but you know, usually when the word goes out that somebody has shot a deer, you know, you'll get, you know, nine, 10 different guys helping you track the deer and everybody just shows up and you go. And like I said, it's in that. And I mean, it kind of helps that I own my own personal tracking dog. So I get a call pretty, I get calls pretty often. Yeah, that's what Tim was telling me. So uh, Tim Woodworth, he's been on our pro staff now for probably, I don't know, six, seven years, probably. And, you know, he when we started this podcast thing up, he was like, yeah, he was like, man, he was like, Jeff is really going to love this. He's going to want to come on because we were we were talking about CWD. And here recently, we've been, we've been talking a lot about CWD. And um, I was talking to you about that earlier. And that kind of plays in with your APR that you were talking about, the antler point restriction can you explain that to us well here a few years ago we got into we had a confirmed case of uh, chronic wasting disease and um of course the dnr come in and uh the first thing they did was they took all regulations off any kind of like uh aprs which is antler point restrictions we had two two buck tags and the second tag tag had a, a restriction on it for what you could shoot and they come in and the first thing they did was they wiped that out they pretty much said you could kill as many deer as you want um it was basically unlimited for the for doe permits and stuff. And it was kind of getting crazy there. So in the midst of all that, there was a good friend of mine named Lincoln Roan up here in Michigan. He started a group called Michigan Deer Hunters, Let Them Go, Let Them Grow. And this is all kind of blended all together because when that thing was taken off, you know, it hit 10,000 people and then it hit 30,000 people. And next thing you know, there's 60,000 people and these guys wow. that joined this group. And right in the middle of all that, we started getting into the CWD thing and we were pushing for some antler point restrictions for the whole state of Michigan. Um, our northwest 13 counties of the lower peninsula, if you look at your hand, it would be kind of where you're ring finger and your pinky is and uh they got 13 counties up there in the corner that have aprs and the, and the minimum on that is three points on one side it's got to have at least three points on one side and we were got involved in that group and we were trying to we were pushing for statewide aprs which yeah. the lower part of the northern 
or the lower, lo, the northern part of the lower peninsula would stay with that three points on one side. We're pushing for statewide APRs below a line to the southern Michigan of four points on one side. And like I said, we got back into the mix of that and we got CWD. We had a confirmed case here in Montgomery County where I'm at and in uh, Kent County and surrounding counties. And then it kind of spread to another county and we had three counties here real quick. And now we got a CWD zone of five counties. Well, um, in the midst of that, we, wow. we try to figure out how we were going to shoot more does. And to, to manage our deer herd, the DNR wanted to shoot more does. And a proposal was put out to our NRC down in Lansing, which is the Natu Natural Resource Commission. Okay. Um, it's That's separate of our DNR. That's a, a, a council of people that make the decisions for rules and regulations based on scientific data. Okay. So when we got that word and we started looking at these this data from this APR counties up there, they were doing what they were supposed to do. So we put out a proposal to say, hey, let's try to put these um, APRs in the CWD counties and see if we can get some hunters to maybe harvest some more does to maybe control that doe population a little bit better. At that time, we were figuring that we were shooting about one point two bucks to every doe that we shot so basically we were shooting more bucks than we were shooting does and uh and pretty accurate i mean i think for the for the most part that's probably true uh we did a three-year study we got the aprs that went into a three-year year study and it could have been terminated at any time but it did run its full three years um at the end of that study we just got that study back this year we got the information we had dropped our doe harvest to 0.8 bucks per every doe that we shot. So basically now we're shooting more does than we're shooting bucks. That information kind of come out a little bit late for before our rules and regulations got posted by the DNR this year. So we got some we got some stuff that's going on through with that right now that we're trying to work out up here in Michigan and and hopefully we can we can resolve that because basically they just pulled all our antler point restrictions right back off our tags and our CWD zone. So that's kind of where we're at with that. But back to the the APR thing, that was a statewide thing. Um, it, it basically people start yelling or getting upset that, oh, you're trying to tell me what I can kill. Um, we made sure that like the youth hunters and stuff was exempt from that. You know, youths can still shoot what they want. We want the youth to get out there. We want recruitment. Yeah, we want it, you know, for the enjoyment. And that's another thing is the, the hunter recruitment and to keep hunters in it. We're, we're hemorrhaging hunters in Michigan and every year it's, it's not like a thousand, it's like 30,000 hunters at a time that we're losing every year. Um, it did come back up a little bit in 2020, be, probably because of the COVID thing when everybody's home and wanted to go hunting. So that gave them something to do. Um, those numbers, I do believe the last year have dropped again, that we've lost hunters again, but in the, like I said, a little bit earlier ago in the Northwest 13 up there, we have those counties and the hunter recruitment has stayed the same or even gotten better up there. People are actually traveling in within the state of Michigan just to go hunt those counties where they have APRs. So it, obviously there's hunters out there that, that want bigger deer. And that's, like I said, I mean, that's, that's one of the aspects of APRs. You get bigger deer and, but the thing of managing your deer herd overall is probably the big successful thing of that. Um, well, Jeff, I'm telling you, man, if anybody needs to know how to shoot a doe, I am your man. <laughs> okay. I can tell somebody how to hunt a doe. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That, that's good. I mean, we're into the ninth day of our archery season up here, bud, and my freezer's already full. That's so, awesome. That is oh, awesome. Just kidding around. <laughs> well, so. I think uh, we're going to take a little break, and uh, we'll be right back with Jeff Antis. This segment of On the Limb with Nature's Voice Game Calls is brought to you by AMG Network Hosting, LLC, a national independent agent for most major telecommunication service providers. If your business is in need of internet, phones, credit card processing, let AMG Hosting help you compare options. They work with over 100 national carriers, and they can help you choose the best option for your needs. Our independence means we are loyal to our customers, not a brand or a company. Call us today at 304-608-3653 or visit us at amgnhconsulting.com amgnhconsulting.com phone number again is 304-608-3653 amg network hosting llc all right guys we're back on the limb with nature's voice game calls we got jeff antis here today talking about uh apr which is antler point restrictions and the co-op that he helps run there in michigan 
So I think Dan and uh, Dave has some questions for you. Jeff, go ahead, Dan. So uh, for one, uh, you was talking about the popula- hunting population being down. You, you know, we're, in West Virginia, we kind of, we're kind of seeing an uptrend. What's affecting you guys in Michigan that you would think the population's down? I believe a lot of it's mismanagement of our deer herd. Our our rules and regulations are pretty hard to understand. There's we're trying to manage a deer herd that's very diverse from south to north. Um, our upper peninsula is completely totally different than our lower peninsula. And then when you get into the southern peninsula, and then the south end of the south, you know, you get down towards Ohio and Indiana and them them counties down here in southern Michigan, southern lower Michigan. I mean, it's white and black. I mean, it's completely different. I mean, the 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 deer population down here flourishes. We have a lot of crops, and but we're trying to manage this whole state as one big giant piece of property and it and it's it's not working out very well for us because our deer population is crashing in the UP. It, I mean, there's some stuff going on with habitat up there and we got wolves up there now and I'm not bashing wolves or nothing like that. But the wolves are a factor and the, and the bear populations are a big factor in the northern part of the, the state. We don't have those down here in the southern Michigan. So we got lots of cropland. We have perfect habitat for deer. So, I mean, our, our populations are crazy. But so the hunters are getting, no, I don't know, they're getting frustrated, I think. Um, that's like I said, well, that's one of the things you bring up hunting. If you have a, a, a group of 10 hunters yeah. and you can get nine of them to agree on one thing, sure, you're doing a good thing here. So. I think a lot of that is is just everything from just the regulations and what people want these days. I mean, social media is a big thing. I mean, we we click on Facebook and we look at these big bucks that people are shooting and and all these big trail camera pictures of these big bucks and all that. Well, guys aren't seeing that. I mean, they they go out and most of Michigan private land is, are smaller pieces and smaller partials of property. You know, eighty acres is a big piece of property and in most of Southern Michigan and, uh, and not always, but it is. But if, if you feel that your neighbors are shooting all those deer off or, or doing thing, and like, like we can go back to the co-op thing. That's one thing that that helps is you communicate, you know, some neighbors are thinking that this guy's shooting all the does and this guy don't think he's shooting any does. So he shoots more does. Nobody knows what nobody's doing. So. Oh yeah, and, for sure. And we lost that with each other. So I think a lot of that's just the mismanagement of our deer herd. That makes sense. I got a question too, Jeff. Um, you mentioned earlier helping people do like food plots and stuff like that. I know, you know, there's some people <clears throat> buying property and stuff like that. And like my dad, he bought property here not too long ago. Just knowing how to like how to do that. Do you do you recommend just doing like an alfalfa? Uh, and and do you do something like where you plow the ground or do you? Because I know some people just kind of throw seed on top of the ground too. I don't know. Uh, is is there something specific that you do with that? Um, the, when you start talking food, ta- food plots and habitat, I kind of lump them all together. Cause like I said, I mean, the habitat thing goes across the, the whole spectrum from cover to food. Right. Um, basically you look at what you need. Um, like I said, I'm in a pretty farm rich area and the farmers feed the deer through the summer. I mean, they're in these big soybean fields and they do all, you know, there's tons of food out there. So basically, um, uh, I mentioned it earlier when I was, I was talking I don't remember if I was talking on here or not, but I, I mentioned Wayne Sitton. Um, he manages Turtle Lake Hunting Club up here in Michigan. And Dr. James Kroll is a big influencer up there. And I got to go up there a couple of years ago and I got to do a ne- necropsy up there in the first of February. And I was talking to James Kroll, sitting down face to face. And I was talking about what to, what to plant for food plots and what to do this. And, and he said, you look at your, you look at what you got and you look at what you need. Um, basically Wayne Sinton's got a YouTube video out there and I'd love to get that link. So you guys, can, somebody watch that, but Wayne Sinton on dome management. And in that video, he'll tell you that, that scientifically study that deer need approximately six pounds of food a day, every day. Wow. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, I guess, but if you get up in the Northern Michigan or here, even Michigan in winter, and you go out in March and you try to find six pounds of food, it's pretty hard to scratch it up. So yeah, it's going to be got, tough. So when you need deer that get six pounds, six pounds of food a day, you're looking at about a ton of food for just that one deer. Um, That goes right back into like your deer management and your habitat. The biggest stresses on, on the deer herd is food and breeding. So that's where it comes back to where that deer management comes back to where 
you try to strive for that one to one buck to doe ratio or the best you can get that ratio. And then you got um, deer densities, which you're looking at how much, how many deer in a certain area. And then you start looking at what you got for habitat and what, what yeah. you can support on that horizon out there for those deer. Um, basically, if you got lots of food, you can, you can afford a lot of deer. If you don't got a lot of food, you can't have a lot of deer. And the, the but the more food you take away from them, deer, the the more stress those bucks and stuff have them on have on them in winter and they're coming out of the rut and they come out of breeding season and they're they're basically starving to death so wow and if they don't got no food available that's the thing but you guys down south i mean you got a good growing season down there you probably your greens would work good and and stuff like that you kind of look at what you need and and you kind of i mean i just i guess if i had to suggest to anybody i would say start with something i mean mm-hmm. whether it's even an eight an eighth acre of alfalfa or a half an acre of soybeans or i know that you know sometimes there's different foods for different parts of the country so um yeah and that's kind of where i'd go with that just kind of look at what you need what you what your deer herd's already lacking you know well um jeff i've got a couple more questions here when we come back but we're going to go ahead and take a quick break and we'll be right back with jeff antis This episode of On the Limb with Nature's Voice Game Calls is brought to you by Apparition Sense, an outdoor and sporting goods company based in Dillinger, Pennsylvania. All of their scents developed and hand bottled with strict attention being paid to every detail. Contact them today at 724-998-7646 or check them out at apparitionsense.com. 100% lethal or your money back guaranteed. Get a hold of them today at 724-998-7646. 7646 or check them out at apparitionsense.com. All right, guys, we're back on the limb with Jeff Antis, and uh, we're talking a little bit of everything today. We're talking co op that he helps out with there in Michigan. We're talking uh, APR, which is, if you don't know, antler point restrictions. Um, some states have those in the U.S., I know West Virginia does not have an uh, antler point restriction but uh, Michigan does. And we've been talking a little bit about CWD. So we're hitting on a lot of different points today, but uh, one of the things we like to do during our podcast is our scripture. Well, excuse me, not our scripture, our salute to service. And uh, our salute to service today is going to be done by Dan. So he's got that ready to go. Yes, I do. Yeah, we do a scripture too, Mike, though. So you wasn't wrong on that. But uh, tonight, our salute to service honors Wesley McCourt. Wesley was born in Webster Springs, West Virginia, where he joined the military in July of 1963, and he was active duty for two years and 11 months. He served in the Vietnam War for a year and nine months, where he was an automotive repairman, and he was also served as a clerk, where he was a driver to the higher-ranking officials. He, uh, he received the Vietnam Service Medal, a Good Conduct Medal, the National Defense Service Medal, Yeah, he was an expert marksman during his time in service, and we just want to thank Wesley for his time in service, his time spent overseas in Vietnam. He, you know, he he's one of the guys that made this country great. I mean, it it, they made it what it is today, and so we we just want to thank you, sir, and our thoughts and prayers go out to you. Yes, thank you, sir. God bless you, and thank you for your service. All right, Jeff. So we're going to go right back into CWD. We were talking there during the break, and uh, so. Michigan has uh, their uh, what what kind of scientific evidence was they leaning towards when they were doing the their uh, things there with the CWD? Basically, they went right to Wisconsin. What Wisconsin was doing with CWD, um, they pretty much all the information we got came right right from there. That was where they were going to implement, you know, trying to lower the deer populations, I think, and and some other things. And that kind of just you know there was. There was some information out there, but it's kind of repetitive information, you know, from just from state to state. And then this guy uses that and this guy uses that and that and they just use the same thing. So pretty much that's the only science that they they really went by is what pretty much they had in Wisconsin. I got you. So we recently had a lobbyist on uh, Jason Webb here from West Virginia and uh, different states that he's worked with, Pennsylvania and West Virginia and a couple others. They basically uh, followed the science that Dr. Uh, Davin Henderson from Colorado State University had done studies on live deer with um, that he, he tried to get them 
to get CWD. And it was like uh, through their urine and through their feces and things like that. And basically, the what he come about is uh, talking about um, the prions that are malformed or misfolded within a deer. It's kind of like something within humans. It's kind of like dementia or uh, Alzheimer's. And so that's the that's the science that most of these states have been following. And it's it's helped get a lot of states that are trying to outlaw scents and different uh, natural urines overturned because it's based off of actual live deer. He so said is, that is that, does that mean it's like more like a genetic type thing? I, I'm thinking that it's more that way geared towards genetics. But basically, the, the with the deer urine thing, you know, a deer would have to consume over 200,000 gallons of deer urine for it to get infected with CWD right. from a deer that had CWD. So, yep. I mean, that there's just no evidence behind that that allows or that states that deer are getting CWD by urine and feces. There is more that I think they said it was like 10,000 more uh, prions or thousands more prions in brain matter than that there was in fecal matter and deer right. urine. So we all know that deer does not eat themselves or they don't eat other deer after they die. So it's, it's kind of impossible for a deer to get that from another deer unless they're, you know, eating the feces or drinking the urine from another deer or eating their brains. I mean, I mean, honestly. Yep. Let, let me jump in here a second. The, the basically with a from what I've because I've got pretty involved with all that. Basically, the prions is a basically a misfolded protein. Um Yes, it's, it's something correct. that we take in and that and that protein gets so the prions get into your into their body and then that starts affecting healthy proteins and then it c- keeps going and going. Um, you, yes, you talk about sci- scientific data. I've asked and asked our DNR here in Michigan. I would like to see a, 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 a study that shows that a deer has actually died from CWD now. People say, well, they get skinny and they die. Well, usually it's an underlying thing of like pneumonia or something else that's wrong with the deer. There is, unless I'm wrong, unless somebody can send it to me and and they can contact you and forward it to me, anywhere there's a place where a deer has actually died from CWD. There's there's not a deer that has died from CWD and the deer have died from complications that went along with it. But that's another thing in a total different scope of things, too. But, yeah, I, I'm familiar with those studies of where they were where they did that. I'm familiar with lots of studies where they actually took brain matter of deer that were positive for CWD and actually fed it straight directly to fawns and just to try to get try to get them fawns to have it. And I, I believe there was there was a couple of the cases that the, actually they fed them enough that they actually did come up positive for CWD eventually. But, yeah, that's that's kind of a little more little more in there. But, yeah, I'm familiar with that scientific thing. And, that, and that's the thing is we need to get some of these peer reviews where that the science world needs to look at these and and start believing in them. So. So, yeah, I just, sorry for the jump in there, but I just no, thought no, that's, would. that's good. That's good points. Let's take a break real quick and uh, we'll come right back in. This episode of On the Limb with Nature's Voice Game Calls is brought to you by Top Down Construction, a local construction company located in Hurricane, West Virginia. A veteran owned and operated construction company ready to tackle any project. With over 25 years of experience in the industry, they offer a wealth of knowledge from design to completion. Contact them today at 304-415-2203 and let them make your dream a reality. You can also check them out on their Facebook page or call them today at 304-415-2203. All right, guys, we're back on the limb with Nature's Voice Game Calls. We got Jeff Antis here, and uh, we're getting into a little bit of a debate on CWD. Uh, Just to go back to some of the things that we've had on previous episodes, uh, we had Jason Webb on here talking about uh, Dr. Davin Henderson and his studies. And uh, just to let you guys know, we're not affiliated. We're not paid by any of those um, those companies there or those people. So 
we're just trying to give out information uh, on the CWD issue. And if you want to go and research those, you can go to cwdevolution.com. And you can also go to responsiblesense.com. You will find all the information there that has been in our previous episodes. And those have also been linked in our uh, descriptions in our podcast episodes. So, Dan, you just got done with our uh, salute to service there. Jeff, uh, we appreciate you coming on this evening. Anything that you would like to go over that we maybe missed before you get off? Um, no, just basically that, you know, the, the big thing is to communicate with your neighbors and and have fun hunting, you know, bring back the fun. That's yeah. all I got to say about that. Yeah, I, I, I do have one real quick question. You uh, can't do it, Dave or Dan. You cannot do it. <laughs> well, I'm going to do it. No, it it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, West Virginia doesn't have this APR, antler point restrictions or anything of the such. I know you guys do. So say I'm hunting Michigan and I kill kill a three point. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys are, what, a four point? on one side minimum well, actually actually right now that was that was taken away from we have two buck tags and there was the only restriction on the first tag would be a three inch antler and on okay. the second tag and the second tag it was four points on one side there's other different parts of michigan have different different regulations our handbook is kind of hard to read but yeah so like right now in my area we have no antler point restrictions you can kill whatever you want on okay both tags. so okay so my my question was then what if you're in one of those regions and and you kill one that you thought at 150 200 yards you thought all oh, that was that was big enough what happens when you get up there and you get that you, you get that phenomenal antler shrinkage <laughs> well ba basically they they the our dnr basically asked that you would report that basically you turn yourself in and say hey i made a mistake and nine out of ten times you know they would let you keep the deer and sometimes sure. they would take the deer away from you and i mean you kind of if you were trying to sneak around and get away with something then you're breaking the law but if you're kind of opening forward with that right. i mean it, it was it was just kind of you reported yourself okay all right so uh, one of the other things that we like to do during our podcast is do a scripture of the day. And, you know, our, uh, like I'm going to say all the time, is our, our platform is God, family, country, and everything outdoors. So uh, we like to always include the scripture of the day here. So I think Dave's got that ready to go. Yes, sir. So scripture today is going to come out of Second uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. And, you know, I like reading out of the Passion Translation. It kind of uh, dumbs it down a little bit for me. It puts it in more a little, uh, little bit more plain English. Sure. You know, nothing against any of the other ones. That's just kind of what I read when I'm reading to myself. So um, he says, we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but the unseen realm is eternal. I think, you know, you just kind of, you know, it's a good idea to try to keep that in your mind, you know, when you're dealing with situations um, in your life, I mean, storms come to everybody, you know, uh, it's just um, trying to make sure you stay mindful of the rock in your life. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think, I think a lot of times that'll keep your boat from capsizing. That makes yep. any sense. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, that's that's one of the main reasons I love the outdoors and fishing and stuff like that, because it just it's a it's a piece that I get while I'm out there in the woods in God's creation. And just knowing that everything that you see out there was created from something that we can't see. Yep. I mean, that's just that's just awesome, man. I mean, that's Absolutely. God's glory right in front of us. Love it. Well, Jeff. We thank you for being with us this evening and taking the time to answer all our crazy questions and hang out with us and um, hope we didn't bug you too much. But uh, we appreciate all the information that you uh, shared with us this evening, and we'd like to have you back on at some other point. Uh, right now, it's archery season in our area. You know, we're going to try to do these things based upon seasons and things. So we got gun season fast approaching next month. Our starts here the first Monday of Thanksgiving week. So, but uh, we'd like to have you back on at some other point. And like I said, we appreciate you being on. We thank you. Thank you guys. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, you know, thanks a lot for the invite. And I don't know how great the, the communication was, but I'm hoping that there was something there that somebody could hear. So uh, it was awesome, Jeff. I got a lot out of it. Definitely. Yeah. yeah it was a pleasure. Definitely. Yep. All right. We man. sure. Thank you. And thank like you said, guys too. 
we'll have you back on there at some point. But uh, that'll be it for this evening. So we're going to sign off, everybody. We appreciate you listening. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And uh, we are also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and anywhere you get your podcasts, we're there. So check us out, give us a review, and follow us. Thanks for listening, guys. You all have a good night. Thanks, guys. Thanks. This episode of On the Limb with Nature's Voice Game Calls is brought to you by Carts Towing and Timco Auto Transport. Local and long-distance towing, auto recovery, roadside assistance, auto lockouts, and jump starts. And they also do repossessions. Give them a call today at 304-949-2323 or 304-925-0858. Again, that's Carts Towing and Timco Auto Transport, 304-949-2323, 304-925-0858.